Live from New York, it's theCUBE, covering Big Data NYC 2015. Brought to you by Hortonworks, IBM, EMC, and Pivotal. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is theCUBE. We're here, this is day three coverage of Big Data NYC, which we run concurrently to Strata. Scott now is here, he's the CTO of Hortonworks. Uh, we got a segment, Scott, on just Hortonworks. Came on you know, uh, yesterday with your colleague, Ron Bodkin from Teradata and Think Big Analytics. So it's really great to have you back. Thanks for coming on. Thanks very much. So we just had uh, Merv on, and we were asking him, well, what's the big theme over, over there at Javits? And he said, well, he boiled it down to two things, simplicity and the store. <laughs> and uh, a lot of people, and it, it, he threw in a, several others over the course of the interview, talking about data in motion, and being able to ingest data, all kinds of really interesting innovations going on. What's your take on the big themes that you're hearing this year from customers and the ecosystem generally? I think the big thing is, and we talked uh, last time we were together in, in the summer, is moving from uh, really cool tech to what am I doing with it? How am I changing my business? How am I creating value from the technology? And, and as you start to see the early adopters uh, get more mature and the second wave of adopters come in, it's natural to expect a, a drive for more simplification, right? So, you know, it, simplification covers a lot of aspects. It could be anywhere from, I don't want a command line, I actually want a GUI so that normal human beings can use it. Uh, it could be, how do I integrate the projects? How do I make deployment easier? How do I make governance and security easier? Those are all kind of the second order questions that we're starting to really hear a lot of energy around. Yeah, and so, um on the simplicity piece, you know, the other thing Merv was saying that I found interesting was that there's so many new projects going on. I, I know you're closer to it than I am, but the skills that you learned a year or two ago are becoming you know, outdated instantaneously. Um, and that's a challenge for organizations. How do you see the ecosystem dealing with that challenge? Is it a matter of just more training, you know, more resources? And, uh, absolutely, you know, there, there certainly uh, is a great network of uh, information flowing out there. Being in an open world, it's easier to obtain the skills. It's, you know, you don't have to sign up for training and pay money. You can go online and learn things. So there's that aspect of, of the environment that we live in, but certainly what we're trying to do with Hortonworks is really innovate around the core rather than create a whole bunch of new separate different projects that you have to understand. Mm -hmm. Trying to make it a little bit more consumable but at the same time, leverage that open community for innovation, and it's a balancing act. Well, so follow up on that, and then Georgia, I want you to jump in here, but so you, the big distro vendors, you know, the big three, um, two have sort of announced database projects uh, this year, kind of end running HDFS. You guys have a different strategy, sort of evolve HDFS. I wonder if you could sort of confirm what I just said, and I may have got it a little bit off, but then I wonder if you could talk about the Hortonworks approach. Yeah, so again, our approach is really to innovate at the core and make the core better. And I, I think that's founded on you know, a couple of the key constructs of, of our belief system in terms of running a business and the business model. The first is that you really can't beat the open community, right? And so we've seen huge innovation. This is where the whole Hadoop ecosystem really started, is a community that's very open, leveraging innovation. And you know, and you know, from my history, having worked in a proprietary software company for a long time, one of the biggest differences that I see is you know, developers in the open world actually gain credibility by sharing ideas versus in a, in a proprietary development model, right? Having ideas in your head is your job value, so you sometimes keep more of it to yourself. So that openness and the community open is, is really appealing because people gain credibility by sharing ideas, sharing ideas, you get more eyeballs on the problem. You cannot out-innovate the open community model. So I think that's one of the, the core and foundational uh, ideas that we have. And then obviously getting into how do we deliver and make the technology consumable, it's really at this point, as I mentioned, and we talked you know, at the very beginning, it's about simplicity. So do I really want another project or another six projects, or do I just want to make it work in the core? And so to the extent that some of the core underlying technology can be extended and, and will work and we can leverage the open community, that's obviously a first strategy. If there's some net new uh, piece of uh, work that needs to get done, 
uh, as an example, data governance is one of those second order things that becomes very interesting. And so we went and we worked with the community and some of our customers and we built Apache Atlas as an open community project to go solve governance because there really weren't assets in the stack before that covered uh, that aspect. So, uh, so, so I think you know, sticking to the core, making the core work better, and leveraging the open community is more the strategy than creating you know, 16 new projects to solve a very thin slice of, of uh, functionality. Um, just as a follow up to that, Scott, uh, one of the things that um, Databricks did to simplify access to sort of all the Spark APIs was the, the notebook um, capability. So it's like one, like one development environment. If I date myself, it's maybe like Visual Basic making it easier to work with or build wi Windows apps. Um, but there's a Zeppelin project that for, for Hadoop. Can a notebook um, simplify a bunch of separate projects so that a developer has that same experience or similar experience to working with Spark? It, and, I, and I think that you've hit on, on another aspect of the simplification, which is really moving from command line to UI. And, and so that is an area where we, you know, through Ambari and Ambari views in the management infrastructure that space have been starting, question, to, yeah, starting to build that out. And yeah, I think there's a lot of promise behind projects like Apache Zeppelin where, uh, again, you can have an open community development kind of environment, but actually take it up a level to the user experience. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, again, having uh, yesterday in the interview, we talked about having seen this movie before, I think, in one of the, uh, getting to mass adoption means that you have to take away, you know, some of, some of the difficulty uh, and make it a little bit more easy to consume. And so I think some of these UI projects are extremely important because we can get more eyeballs, we can get more folks, it's very easy to come on board and take advantage of the technology. There's a trade-off. I, I, the, the fact that you have so many projects gives you know, huge choice. You can do the mix and match to build, say, an analytic pipeline in a way that would be much more difficult with monolithic, monolithic DBMS. Um, but at the same time, if you've got all these projects evolving independently, putting a GUI over them can be a challenge as opposed to putting them on one sort of de unified development cycle. Um, it can be a challenge. I think one of the things uh, that you'll see is, you know, with rapid adoption and deployment is as, as winners emerge in the GUI, and certainly Ambari and Ambari Views is emerging as a winner in that space, I think, I think Zeppelin obviously has uh, that opportunity as well. I think a lot of the, the project owners will say, gee, it's a, to my advantage to fit into that framework, so how do I code to that API? How do I make it more compatible? So you actually turn it around and say, okay. the leverage is how do I get more users uh, taking advantage of the technology, and it becomes a pull more than a push. Okay. So, I know, I don't know if you heard what I said last night in the panel, but I talked about, I was reading Silicon Angle the other day and, and they were quoting me from theCUBE and, I said, and I, we were closing and I said this, this space is crowded, you know, overfunded, you know, profitless, but has a lot of potential. Um, and we talked about that uh, on the panel. And I, I don't think you know, stating things that are factually incorrect, but it has implications. And you can turn those all into positives. It's good that there's a lot of funding. You know, it's good that it's crowded, there's innovation. Um, my question, Scott, is there's a lot of discussion in the community about, geez, there's, there's not a lot of IP because it's all open source. What happens to all these companies who have all this funding? You, Hortonworks, not concerned about that. You have a different business model. I, I wonder if you could sort of comment on, on that, just the, the lack of you know, hardcore IP that is you know, right, let's say, for instance, for an acquisition, um, and how that relates to what you guys are doing. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the open source phenomenon as it relates to this space is really, is certainly very much driven by the rapid pace, the rapid change, frankly, the rapid growth of volume of data and <coughs> sensors and standards and, and all of those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like chicken egg. Did, did open source come first or did the requirements come first? I think they really fit hand in glove, right? And, and so you're right, in, in an open world, the environment is completely different, right? Your influence is not what's between your ears, your influence is how you 
package it, deploy it, make it supportable for customers, and go find that business value rapidly and support your customers. And that's obviously the business model that we at Hortonworks have built around. So, um, and I think that it's a dramatic shift where the value is not in owning the software anymore, the value is in delivering, deploying, packaging, and supporting. Yeah, so I mean, there, actually there is IP there, you just don't charge for it. <laughs> That's correct. Or yeah, you monetize it differently. <laughs> yeah, we'll monetize it differently. Yeah, you, you, well, it's interesting, our, our data suggests that the number of people actually paying for things like Hadoop, you know, for Hadoop specifically, is way, way up this year relative to last year. Um, I think two thirds are actually paying. Last year was around 25%, so we're seeing a huge, huge spike. Even though you know, there's a lot of talk about adoption, maybe being slow and, and so forth, the, the, the number of organizations that are getting more serious is clearly on the rise, and you can see that, I'm sure, you know, across the street, right? So I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, I think, like anything, you, you move from science project to dabbling to trying out an application to moving into production. And when you start to move in that application into production, that's really where paying for the Hadoop infrastructure becomes important and interesting, making sure that it's supportable. As those production applications start to drive business value, as they drive business process, uh, having the ability to do change management, change control, understand that it's been tested, understand that it's secure, that you can do data governance around it, those things become more interesting, and I think that's where you get the on-ramp to now, yeah, I need to, I want to go with a trusted uh, provider and get support. Mm -hmm. Following up on that thought process, uh, I mean, it makes, as you were saying, it makes perfect sense that, you know, as you go into production, you need a support relationship, but is there an opportunity for the distro vendors to be even more proactive, not the break-fix model, perhaps, to peer into the, the um, the deployment, a customer's deployment, and and look how it's operating, and proactively help them do better. Yeah, and and actually that was that's kind of the the, the next thing uh, that that I was going to get to. So it's perfect. Is I think it, it uh, we talk about what's the value and how do how do we go create value in this market in an open source world, right? It, you have a support case. The support case comes in, there's a bug, I, or there's a function that's missing that I really want. Working with a vendor that's got lots of committers and has got a lot of the folks who can go impact the community and get those things in, not just a bug fix, but actually a design implementation change to really make the product better. I, I think that's really a differentiator in who, how you choose a distribution vendor, how you choose who you go support, and that's certainly a big part of the value add that we provide in terms of being able to get that and drive back into the community, not only changes, bug fixes, stability improvements, but gee, we have a cluster of customers that really want to do this. Let's get that added to our feature functionality. Okay, uh, let's talk about ODP a little bit. We had a panel last night. Um, ODPI. OD, ODPI, sorry. What's the I stand for? Yeah, I'm still confused on that. <laughs> <laughs> it stands for whatever you want it to stand for. <laughs> IODP even. Um, okay, so we talked about a lot of things, and it was really the purpose of the panel was to give us ODP's vision of the, the enterprise. And we, I think, openly discussed many, many things. So I wanted to, so George, the components of, oh, help me here, of ODP, Ma Abari, MapReduce, HDFS, Abari. Yeah. MapReduce, what's, you got it. What's, yarn? Ma what's, the, what's the fourth? Yarn. Yarn, yarn. Yeah. thank you. Oh. So can we talk about, um, in the context of the discussion that we were just having, sort of how you're evolving each of those. A lot of talk about, oh, MapReduce, you know, we're replacing MapReduce with X. Um, uh, and obviously, you know, HDFS, you just mentioned, you guys are evolving that. Yarn was, you know, innovation that you guys came up, the community came up with a couple years ago. So can you talk about those components and their roadmap? Um, well, I mean, first off, with the, the, the whole ODPI thing, I think is a really significant uh, and important thing in the, in the industry and actually um, have been a supporter of the notion for some time. And, and that notion is, you know, in this world where there's innovation coming all the time, new projects, keeping track of it, having a core set of services and defining that as kind of a common kernel, very much like in the Linux industry, there's a common kernel. There are multiple distribution vendors, there are other packages you can install, but there's a common kernel. That means that application developers can now code to the lowest common denominator and at least understand that their applications and the certification efforts are uh, a little bit more streamlined and simplified because they have that, that common kernel. 
So I think that I think that that's actually really important for the industry, so that we can avoid a lot of fragmentation and and non compatibility, which will be very difficult for consumers of the technology to go deal with. Uh, so inside of that common core, obviously. We at Hortonworks and, and, and as a driver and, and frankly the committer of, of the ODP core assets, want to make sure that we have extreme stability, scalability, depend on all the illities uh, around each of those core, each of those core components. And, um, and so you'll see us uh, continuing to come out with new innovations. Um, I would say probably the most rapid innovation that you'll see because it's one of the newer components is in the Ambari stack. Uh, creating a common control and management uh, infrastructure framework and user interface for management of the cluster. Um, and I think, you know, inside of the other core components, we continue to drive new innovation in, in each of the other layers. I would say, however, you'll probably notice more in Ambari just because it's a little bit newer than some of the other components. What about MapReduce and the future of MapReduce? The future of MapReduce, you know, the, the, the core tech, I think there are still some functionality and uh, scalability things and stability things that we can build uh, into MapReduce, and I think that uh, uh, it's actually uh, an underlying core tech that a lot of applications are using. Um, and so I, I don't uh, predict the end of MapReduce like uh, some uh, pundits have been doing. I think it will continue. Over time, I think there will be more engines that come along, that come and go, that serve different needs, uh, and that's okay. It's an ecosystem play, and you know the center of the universe is really moving up to the yarn layer anyway. And so being able to plug uh, additional engines in to work in, uh, in addition to a MapReduce framework will be very interesting. So MapReduce maybe becomes invisible but you use the resource negotiator as sort of what people are going to touch yep. and feel and see. Go ahead, George. Um, along the lines of um, ODP, there's, there's commonality and I imagine that makes it easier to support. With the movement to hybrid um, deployments, you know, on-prem and cloud, does the value add opportunities change for a distro vendor when they're on the cloud, everyone's you know, potentially on the same release? Um, your ability to help people run is sort of the same across all customers. I think that um, I think that the value proposition is a little bit different, and obviously we have been investing very heavily in that space. I think that my prediction is that more than ninety percent will be hybrid. I don't think it'll be either or, but probably both in most instances. And and so to that end. There's an additional level of uh, management to infrastructure that becomes interesting. In the cloud, and we've made uh, some investments with our CloudBreak technology, being able, CloudBreak, uh, being able to provision, you know, cloud providers can provision the hardware, they can provide the, the bare metal, as it were, uh, but then being able to provision, how do I want my Hadoop cluster installed, which packages do I want there, which projects do I want implemented, can I create a blueprint and make that replicable so that I can easily spin up and spin down cloud instances? How do I um, create provisioning and scaling? So one of the big values behind cloud and one of the reasons I think we'll see lots of hybrid implementation is that burst processing. You know, on uh, Monday morning from eight to noon, I need to double my cluster for processing and then I'm done with it till next week. So being able to automatically spool up and spool down and have all of the services work and just have that all be streamlined, that's also part of the value add that we can put into the packaging uh, and build around the support model. Does, do you have a different set of competitors in that circumstance where um, a Microsoft or a Google or an Amazon would be would potentially compete as the cloud part of the hybrid deployment, or is that too difficult if you're the distro for on-prem and the, they would try and be the distro for the I, cloud? I don't see it as competition. I see them as providing the infrastructure as a service and us being able to add value by helping our customers manage the infrastructure that they're provisioning from those providers. Okay, so in other words, the assumption is there's, there's going to be, that you would provide the, the manageability service. We take those services and actually make them even more consumable for our customers. So I think it's a win-win for us and the cloud provider. Okay. So uh, we're, we're out of time, but Scott, last question is, is how are you spending your time um, at Hortonworks as a CTO and how does it sort of differ from what you were doing at Teradata and running Teradata Labs? Uh, you know, uh, it's about the same in terms of how I spend my time. I probably spend uh, about half of my time in front of customers. 
talking with them about what their needs are, where they're going, how we can help them, how we can help them be more successful. Uh, and then obviously the other half of my time with the product management and engineering teams talking about how do we how do we want to impact the roadmap, how do we want to line up our investments and... And, uh, and cracking the whip. And, uh, well, <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd call it that, but yeah. Herding <laughs> cats. <laughs> Herding cats, right. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Scott, thanks very much for coming Thank back you to theCUBE. Great to see you again. Good discussion. Thanks. All right, keep right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is day three from Big Data NYC at Strata and Hadoop World. This is theCUBE, right back. <laughs>